and talk. So we miss having um, spring fling in person so much. We wanted to try and at least do one little thing that would remind you of, of our in-person spring flings. So I hope you've all had time to go to the website and look at all the plants and garden jumble items that we have available. There are still a lot of items left. So go to mamgonlinesales.com and shop after the talk. Okay, that's all for my commercial that I wanted to do. Um, we're gonna welcome Carol Reese to talk to us today. Carol is an extension horticulturalist specialist and a nationally known speaker blending equal parts of garden knowledge, nat natural lore, and quirky humor. Um, Carol is a prolific writer and has produced innumerable newspaper columns and magazine articles, and even wrote for a horticulture magazine back in the day. Um, Carol attributes her love of horticulture to being raised on a farm by generations of plant nuts, and those are her words, um, including her grandfather who dynamited his garden spot each spring to break up the soil. Uh, Carol's very personal appreciation of natural lore is at least partially a result of her nearly daily rambles throughout the wild areas near her home with her motley crew collection of mutts and we are all familiar with all of Carol's great dogs that she has and I hope she'll have a picture of them for us today. Um, Carol is one of the most well-known and loved speakers in our area. I know all of the master gardeners love Carol and we always turn out in big numbers when Carol is available to talk to us. Everyone welcome Carol as she entertains us for um, a little while this afternoon. Carol, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, made me a little tearful there. <clears throat> Aw, well, you know we love you, so. <laughs> I, I do love y'all back. I can always feel the love from you when I, I come that way. And even over uh, in the last Master Gardener class I did, I could feel the love coming through the dead gun computer, y'all. Um, by the way, I, <laughs> can y'all see my opening picture? Am I, I'm already screen yes. sharing. Yeah. Yes, you are. That, you are. That's what can happen when you put your iPhone down on the ground and shoot under the mushrooms. If you ever tried that, just putting your iPhone down on stuff and shooting up, it's pretty cool and fun. All right, well, we'll launch today, and I appreciate y'all being here. You know how I feel about gardeners. We're, we're uh, nurturing people, and I think that's one reason we all share the love of, of the animals and the strays and unwanted. We keep, we keep rescuing things and nurturing things and taking care of it. And, um, I do know that, you know, even just signing up and, and getting on, you're still a doer, right? You're one of those people who says, <clears throat> I'm going to listen, I'm going to go, and I'm going to sign up for Master Gardeners, or I'm going to join this garden symposium. And I miss spring fling, some of my very best little garden items that I enjoy when I walk around my, my landscape. Um, I bought there some of my favorite little painted leaves. So y'all do please shop. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk mostly about the non-plant elements that make our gardens kind of really special. I mean, there'll be some plants in there for sure. And sometimes it's using plants in unusual ways, but <coughs> I love cool plants. I want to talk about sometimes those things that make um, a garden more than just plants, where we look at the ingenuity of a human and the creative mind and the little things that give us pleasure. And most of these today are going to be little. I mean, things that you could do in a day or maybe a couple of days. I'll do a little bit of bigger structural things. Um, but honestly, I'm going to do a talk for the Dixon. Um, in, I think it's in May on just do it. And it's on those bigger landscape elements you might want to put in that are going to transform your life and make your life better and happier. But these are just ideas. I call steal these ideas because I've never had a good idea in my life. I just know how, I'm just smart enough to steal one. <clears throat> Why well, won't my slide, there we go. I, I wanna uh, talk a little bit about just being bold too uh, with color. I know when I first started gardening, I, I kind of heard these snobs who would say things like, you know, oh, whimsy's overdone or, um, you know, I don't use many variegated plants or golden plants because they're so garish. And so I was afraid of offending somebody's sensibilities, but then I found out that the gardens I really, really, really loved were the ones that were fearless. So I encourage you to be fearless and do something fun. This is Alyssa Steve's garden. I was lucky enough to meet 
Um, I spoke at Williamsburg a few years ago and I didn't know anything about Alyssa. Her garden was featured in Fine Gardening uh, a couple of years ago, you may have seen it. And she uses all kinds of fun things, including color. When we get to the paint part of this program, I'll show you some more of Alyssa's garden, but it's an amazing, and I would recommend her, by the way, is a great, great speaker. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about these architectural elements and not necessarily the big things, but some of the other things. Architectural elements are the unique details that form a style. So I'm hoping you're kind of getting a garden style. I think sometimes we imitate others instead of thinking about what really expresses our, what we enjoy and love. And I'm gonna encourage you to, to do that. Remember, it can always be redone, right? So don't be afraid. Uh, and I am, this is a, an example of some of the bigger things I'm gonna talk about for the Dixon where my friends up in uh, Ripley <clears throat> that have that enormous Japanese maple collection. I know that some of you have been there with me. They have about 150 different Japanese maples in their yard. But this is their, actually their little shed in the back where they store their equipment uh, and they put a porch on it. And actually it is part of the screen because behind them is a grocery store kind of, you know, on another street, there's a little valley separating them, but they needed to completely screen out that very unattractive site. So that's where they put their potting shed and then put a porch and, and sitting area on it and made a fabulous outdoor room <clears throat> while accomplishing a couple of goals. So we'll talk about some of those things in that program. And today though, we're gonna talk about, this would require a little bit of um, more effort than just a day, but I wanna talk about entrance because we're entering my talk and it's always fun to kind of have it announced when you're entering a garden or entering a different part of the garden. So there are different styles and different ways to do that. And this idea of going through a door, I think has always been sort of cool when you're visiting a garden and you have to go through the door to enter another aspect. <clears throat> uh, a nice structural element, and I know I've shown this in my landscape design class because I just love the simplicity of it. To me, it had the most, both rustic and graceful appeal um, that invited you into this uh, Chapel Hill, um, one of the UNC gardens, I forgot, it may not be exactly right, but doesn't have to be that major. Here we are back at Alyssa Stevens and this is a simple metal arbor, but what she's done to make it special again is that fearless use of color. She's very fond of this sort of orangey color that she uses throughout her garden, which is one of the tricks uh, to make it look very deliberate instead of just, you know, gaudy and thrown together. If you'll repeat the certain color on different objects throughout the garden, then it looks very, very intentional. So you see how the chair back there repeats that color, but a simple metal arbor with the color of your choice, whatever that might be. I'm a huge fan, for example, of purple. One day I've been saving pictures of all things purple. I wanna do a whole program on purple, purple elements in the garden and purple plants. Jimmy Williams, I've always loved his, this is where you enter his um, woodland garden and he built this himself out of rustic, um, from trees he cut down there on his own land in Paris, Tennessee. And if you haven't been to Jimmy's, y'all need to arrange a tour. He calls it Tennessee Dixter. He did have some damage from a storm um, last year, but you know, even though he's in his 80s, I know Jimmy, what he did was probably took advantage of that to renovate parts of the garden and do something fabulous. Nothing Jimmy does well is notice we kind of have, again, a little bit of repetition here. You see the same tones of silvery and gray, uh, even with very common plants. And it kind of makes that reinforces that style and that, that, that theme. Some of you may have bamboo or access to bamboo. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, malign it because it is certainly in a crowded neighborhood, it would be a detriment because you're gonna have some very unhappy neighbors. There's so many cool projects you can do from bamboo. I have uh, deliberately introduce some on my land. I've got, you know, plenty of property, but the yellow groove to me is one of my favorites. So I want some of the big timber, but look at this simple little gate. And, you know, bamboo does hold up well out in the elements when it's green and very limber, you can do a lot of cool things with it. And I'll show you some of that, but I've seen actually big spheres simply woven out of it, giant balls that were laid on the landscape or hung from the trees. <clears throat> um, entrance can certainly be hay rings and some point I'm gonna launch into my love of all things round. I just am drawn to round, but I stole this idea. This is Linda Askey's garden down in Birmingham. 
And she went to the trouble to powder coat this hay ring, the same color as her um, Wave Hill chairs over there around her fire pit, which is lined with glass blocks, by the way, so that when the fire is flickering and they're sitting around the fire, they enjoy all the colors coming through that glass. But um, it definitely invites you to the fire pit. You want to go through there. Human beings love to go through tunnels and see what's on the other side. Here's mine. It's not um, very well developed yet. Now, instead of having a vine over the top, because I have, of course, my favorite major wheeler honeysuckle several places in my landscape. And, and by the way, hummingbirds have been seen um, in southern parts of, of Memphis, and, I mean, uh, Tennessee. And so go ahead and get those feeders up and out. My clue is always when the red buckeye blooms is when I get my feeders out. So be ready. But this is um, focusing on the lake as you round around the back of the house. It, it centers you to look at the, the pond over there. See, I'm still working on erosion issues, but I'm getting better. I've got a whole bunch of new stuff coming up over there this year. And I did not bother to paint it. And I do need, I'm going to make this eventually gravel that leads you on around to the deck. So it's, oh, instead of a vine, that's where I was. This is actually, I'm going to train a weeping Japanese maple over the top. Now, Ryusen is the maple that I chose because it is not one of those little umbrella shapes. It's not a little hut of a weeper. It's a very snaky, viney weeper. And so it, I've seen that done. Again, I always steal these ideas. I've never had an original thought in my life. And I'm gradually training it to go on over the top and it's getting it's getting up there. I'll have a better picture of it probably by the end of this summer where I'm probably almost to the top with that. It is a green Japanese maple. It does very well in the heat of the South. Um, it has flaming fall color. So if you don't know Ryusen, R-Y-U-S-E-N, it was actually introduced by my friend Ozzy uh, down in Athens, Georgia area. And it's uh, been a very popular maple because it's relatively fast growing, very heat adapted to the South and uh, does a great job. And I have found it by the way, at a very good price at Dabney Nurseries in Memphis. Another way to announce entrance is simply buy two identical pots and two, put two identical plants in there. And you can put those wherever you want around your garden. And it says, come on in, this is, you know, this is where you want to go. So that's a, a quick, easy, sudden thing to do to your garden that's gonna just suddenly go bang, very intentional look. Uh, I've always loved this photo. It's an old one that I had to scan from the slide, so I apologize for the quality. But these are little terracotta pots, and this was at the Antique Rose Emporium uh, near Austin. And somebody in Memphis has done this. Um, it was one of the hydrangea garden tours several years ago, and somebody may type into the chat box if they know whose garden uh, they had done this in Memphis as well. But it's a really cool idea. Those are on cables that are wound together and, and tied together at the top with that little spray of bells, which are actually the terracotta pots. So um, the arch we were invited in, we want to go through there and it's just a real different kind of take. However, after these storms, you may be picking up curving limbs and pieces of vine. Maybe if a tree went down and you've got big thick vines or you know where some are. Uh, this is Brad, oh shoot, Morris's Brad's. I, I may not have the right last name. I remember plant names and dog names. I'm, I apologize y'all, it's Brad. He's a master gardener here in, in Jackson and lives right down the street from my friend Helen Mullen, which is a fabulous garden. But Brad has so many cool ideas y'all. I visited his garden this past spring and I photographed a bunch of stuff. So you're gonna see some new photos uh, that I haven't featured before. And I noticed by the way, what he did is doesn't bother the eye at all, but to establish a framework to attach all these curving limbs and vines, um, he put got some long rebar. You can see that uh, driven down into the ground on either side of that gate and then attached across the top. And then he just used that to support his, his weaving with some wire and such. So don't be afraid to use those things. And for people like me, that doesn't bother my eye at all. It may bother you if you're sort of a perfectionist and don't like the, I like symmetry and asymmetry symmetry together. Now we love arches. We just, human beings, I love the shape of an arch. I don't, you know, we just drawn to it. So I, I was looking at this picture that I took. This was a you know, garden writers tour up in the Raleigh area back in 2009, thinking, well, I'd never be able to build that. And certainly I wouldn't 
that big top structure. I don't want to get up that high off the ground ever again, but I was studying, look at that, how the arch is made itself. And you know, it's just three boards. Can you see they laid a board on the ground and then they laid the two other wide boards at a right angle and then simply drew a line on that to make that perfect curve. Now you can do that if you're ever fooling around with any DIY making circles, just drive up, lay them on the ground, drive a little stake in the ground and get a string. And then with a pencil on the end of the string, then you could draw that perfect circle on those three boards. And then with a jigsaw, cut them out and nail them to your four by fours, eight by eights, whatever you decide to use for your support. And you could make a quick and inexpensive arch for your garden. And by golly, I'm going to this summer. I, you know, my man friend gets upset when I do things that are supposed to be man stuff, but if I wait on him, a lot of times it just doesn't get done. Heck, I can run a jigsaw. I can go buy boards. I can dig a hole. I can put sacred in a hole. I'm doing it and I'm going to. Y'all watch me. I'll tell you this fall I did. Um, years ago, I did this because I was so in love with arches. I had been to see Dan Hinckley's famous garden out up in the Northwest, um, Heronwood. And Heronwood had done this with live trees, with hornbeams. And I loved that look so much. And y'all was living in a little shack on the side of the road while I was saving up money to build the house where I live now for free. And it should have been free. I mean, it was like floors caving in kind of shack. Uh, so I had to build this fence because I was so close to the road to protect my dogs. And it was ugly, but I didn't care. And then one day it just got inspired and I went out and cut a bunch of bamboo out in the, in the forest down there in the bottom land and brought it back on my back. I wish y'all had seen me that day because it was a very windy March day and I was carrying them. You know how you'll carry the um, water buckets back from the well on the pole that's over your back. That's how I was carrying this big bundle of cane and the wind was blowing me hither and yon all across this field. I finally made it home. And I wove these, I just wove them in and out of that wire fence. And then I foolishly planted vines on them, just annual vines, thinking that would be cool. However, that was not good. It kind of obscured the arches. And then the very next hard windstorm, that's what presented too much resistance to the wind. It snapped them. So I wish I'd left it alone. By the way, this was a snowy day in April. I remember that the hummingbirds showed up that day. And I had to run for my hummingbird feeders as I was snapping these pictures. Um, archways, you can actually prune a shrubbery to, to make an arch instead of using a vine. And some people will do that or make the vine and go ahead and be fearlessly prune it to make it a, a really uh, strongly geometric arch. Now, certainly if you want a more formal entryway, this is my friend Nancy Blair and Ron Blair over in Henderson, Tennessee. And that's very nice, but um, I, I can't afford that right now and also so it's, it's, it's more uh, formal than my look. I'm a little bit looser and wilder and cheaper, just frankly cheaper. Now I love, I love a tunnel made by living plants, by living trees. And I photographed this years ago at the Ralston Arboretum. That's actually a weeping form of hackberry. It's a Chinese hackberry. And um, I have not yet found that plant, but y'all we've got lots of other good weeping plants that would loan themselves to doing this effect. So weeping yopon, I've just bought two to do this. And it's not um, as you enter my garden, because that's going to be more of a place you can sit down with benches and an arbor. But as you exit the garden on the far side to get out to my little access road, I'm going to train my weeping yopons up to be a uh, living archway that you pass through. Uh, Linda Orton's house, she has a different house now, but before she had uh, sold her house and gone on like two years of traveling around the world, bless her heart. What a great thing to do. Shared all that with us via Facebook. This was the entranceway to one of her little back uh, yard living areas. And now look at that. That's something you could do on, you know, if it weren't raining on a Saturday and go to the big box stores, get your papers, sack them up, get a couple of matching urns or pots and set them on either side and plant them up and boom, you got beautiful little entrance way that says a lot about your garden and it's not really about the plants it's about that strong architectural element all right we're going to go into circles i was trying to think i wonder about weird stuff i know i do 
why do we love a full circle? You know, I thought, well, do we see them in nature? Well, we do sometimes, but they're kind of rare. Like, you know, we get all excited when the moon is full. We'll be looking up at the moon and go, nearly full. It's almost there. Or we find a particularly round rock and we're excited to have that round rock. But I think the human brain likes to find order and geometry. Uh, we love those structural elements that try to make us kind of understand and see the world in ways that make sense. Um, I got thinking about Chris. You know, Chris is a is a very um, renowned pianist. He was really headed for uh, some very prestigious schools when he decided he wanted to be a county agent, y'all. And maybe some of y'all did not know that. But he's a concert pianist, and you know, we like some structure. Music is structure. Music is actually organizing sound in recognizable structure with some improvisation and play in between um, that the human mind craves. I mean, mathematics, it's all structure. It's how we make sense of the world. So I think that we think about that in our landscape design, we will find that all of a sudden we find something that very much pleases us. And then we can also include the random with that. And we're still feeling like we're not just lost in the wilderness. So I'm going to do several things that are circular, circular elements in the garden that I've always found delightful. This is at the stone ciphers. And uh, if you always wanted some kind of water element and you were afraid of having a pool in your yard uh, for one reason or another, I know some people are scared of snakes. I, I'm not, even in spite of my copperhead bite, it was on a woodland path, not near water. Uh, but this one would alleviate that fear. Nobody's going to fall in here and drown. Nobody's going to, there's not going to be a snake hiding there. Well, he might, he might get on those stones to cool off sometime. The circular element provided by this, what I call wet pot, pot with no hole. This is at Fabex in Oak Ridge. And look at all the circular elements, in fact, in this photo. We've got the lotus leaf down below the pot. We've got the beautiful circular lip that she embellished, by the way, with tiles from Hobby Lobby. We've got the circular elements there of the lotus, and we've got the gazing ball in the background. I just think, you know, repeating these circular elements to me is, is just such a delightful thing to think about. But, heck, a wash tub does the same thing. I think Diane has disassembled this little vignette since. I took this picture many years ago, but um, this is at Garden Soy Bay out in Collierville, and that umbrella magnolia perfectly sighted over that simple bench in that wash tub. The uh, spiral, it's actually a circular water garden that develops into a spiral done by Tom Pellet over in Memphis has always been a favorite of mine as well. Circles and spirals always get me, they get me every time. And on one of the garden walks in Cooper Young, and I hope y'all all will um, if you don't know about it, be sure you do attend it in person or look at it online or however they're going to do it this year. I, I think they're going to try to have it open. Um, but notice the circular path just around this tree. This is a fringe tree limbed up and over this beautiful uh, plant. And that circular element just adds so much to it and protects it from lawnmowers. I saw this, um, it was the same garden writer trip up in um, the Raleigh area in 2009, and I remember that's when I first made friends with Linda Askey. I sat beside her on the bus, and y'all, my camera battery went down. And she said, oh, I've been to this garden. Take my battery. We happen to have the same camera. And I'm, it's like pulling the thorn out of the lion's foot. I've loved her ever since, but there's a lot of other reasons to love her. But what I saw here was not just a circular element, but I noticed that looking through it was delightful. And so it inspired me to go back home and move some things I had on a fence or a wall out where I could look through them. I had that spider web hung on a wall and it was wasted. And when I moved it out where I could look through it, and this is at my new house, um, it was a whole different, you know, scene. So think about those things as well and use them to kind of, you know, look through and past and frame your, your natural wild areas. Circular elements can be plants. I like the naturally geometric forms, but if you want to have one sheared little round plant in a pot, do. This is the little cryptomeria called Globosa nana. Nana, small, globosa, globe-shaped. So it's naturally this form, at least for a time, and you can certainly train it to stay more circular in that little round pot. And I just think that's a stunning little garden element. I tend, you know, we tend to put a whole lot of color in things like that. As sometimes I think we should keep it simple. We're going to show a few more examples of that as well. 
and I've shown this in many of my landscape classes because to me it's always amazing that those uh, rings that you kick out of a whiskey barrel set upon end and made into a circular element makes this wild thicket of a landscape look very, very disciplined. And the circular opening to a pot. If you can leave a pot empty, which is very hard to do, you will have that circle wherever you want it in the garden. Drop it into a group of plants and all of a sudden everything is very centered around that port in air, um, like the Wallace Stevens poem, um, A Jar in Tennessee. If you haven't read it, read it and it'll tell you exactly what we're looking at right here. Uh, one of my favorite overhead structures, Felder Rushings. I need to go by sometime. This is an old slide and get digital photographs when Felder's at home. He's in Europe most of the time now. And that circular element that moves that beam of light throughout the day and focuses on different things that he has staged underneath that beam of light, including a blue bottle tree, which I was there too early in the day to get the spotlight on the blue bottle tree. But isn't that a cool idea? We need to do that. Just do some kind of overhead structure and put that circle and make that beam of light play different roles throughout the day. I mean, it's all about light. Everybody who photographs knows that. Anybody who paints knows it's all about light. Look at this millstone set into a walkway at the stone ciphers. Um, I do love this look, but that to me is a dangerous walkway. You know, you're at that age where you dare not fall and break your hip. Um, so <laughs> I might make everything a little bit more level, but it's a stunning look. And I love the old millstones. Mike, by the way, I mean, um, Jason has a gazillion of them. He was supposed to give me one when he built my house. He still hasn't, by the way. All right, let's go into paint. I'm gonna go back to Alyssa Steves there. You recognize that color she likes. She doesn't mind using a few other though. And you know, looking at that teal and orange together on that bench, I noticed I recently binge watched the whole series. I'd only seen part of it originally, the Downton Abbey and all the colors and the rich settings in those things. I noticed those were the same two colors used over and over and over were these wonderful soft and rusty oranges and these gorgeous teal tones, just enough to set it off. And I thought, hmm, that's something to think about. I, I tend to go for the purples, but that was very attractive. Okay, great Dahlia, but really paint the lamppost. I mean, you know, just that little bit, there we go. Repeating that color throughout her garden is what makes you say, okay, cool. That's something we could do in an hour. You know, go to the, store and get your paint mixed and paint it on there or find the spray paint that's close. You could find the paint and then find the plant that matched, I reckon. Isn't that beautiful? The same colors there on her little trellis and upright and bench. So nobody's sitting there. Just we're just about adding that pop of color. Memphis hydrangea people, of course they're gonna love blue. And I love this little vignette here. And if you haven't joined the hydrangea society, even if you're not a hydrangea file, and why wouldn't you be? You need to join or at least go on their tours. Heck, 10, 20 bucks a year, I think is all it is. It's a couple of hundred, three or 400 people strong. And the garden tours are just awesome. You'll see so many cool things like this, plus little solutions, you know, like what they do about drainage. And we're gonna look at some of that in fact in here in just a minute. <clears throat> Back to Cooper Young, just painting that chair, that cool pop of color. And one more little detail I want you to notice that I think is, uh, so another idea we could steal. Notice the welcome. It's just children's blocks. That would be fun to mount those here and there around your garden to say whatever it is that you want to say at that particular point in your garden, right? So don't be afraid of using that paint to have some fun. And even on a raised bed. Uh, I'm going to do some uh, talks on raised beds and that come and talk up at the Dixon. If you want to do raised beds, want to think about some different styles, both you know, very grand and less so. Uh, but I would not have thought that painting that concrete brick like that would look that good, but it really it truly does. So don't be afraid of that paint. And then I did, I stole this off Pinterest. And if you just want to get inspired, I, I go to Pinterest a good bit and just Google in things like art in the garden or creative archways or creative gates. And you're going to get tons and tons and tons of ideas that you might want to adapt. But y'all, those are bricks that are painted to look like books. And I just think that is so much fun. I've got some old shelves, some old metal shelves here and there that I could set up 
uh, in the garden and stack the books on them up there or just use them you know around the garden here and there uh, to hold pots that can stack a stack of books and put a pot on top I, I, I think I'm gonna have to do that this summer too now let's go on into you know stacking things and st stone that's a nice bit of stonework right there and I'm not sure I'm capable of doing that kind of stonework there are certainly YouTube videos on how to do it, or maybe you are so talented enough and can do the tedious work or know somebody and pay somebody to come and do that somewhere in your garden for that beautiful, beautiful pedestal that it provides. Or just find the right group of beautiful stones and stack them up like this is Faybeck's garden. And this is one thing I love about Faye's garden. I wonder, gosh, knows she's got an amazing collection of fabulous rare plants and puts them together beautifully. But you're also going to find your eye following on these just little detailed things. I can just imagine her stacking these up and composing them. Now, it would get knocked over by Otis the pit bull at my house, unless I drove some kind of stake through them or drilled a hole or glued them together or did something. And maybe I could surround it with something where they wouldn't. But I just, I, I just delighted me right there. And the little round stones on top, there we go again with round. This was a cool thing to do with stone, finding the right uh, stones that kind of echo the shapes of the cactus. This was Cooper Young, uh, made him a little mini turret, little castle there of stone to stick their cactus in. And I, I kind of collect cactus. I love the strong architectural element of a cactus. And especially out at my front gate, I'm trying to look really mean and fierce. I don't want people coming around my gate. So I'm putting anything out there that looks like it might hurt people. But I, honestly, it's just I love the shape of them. And if you want to uh, grow cactus or collect cactus, if you can get a pad, and I'm going to recommend that you ask for one, although sometimes when it's out at the road and there's nobody home, did a little pad that nobody would notice was missing end up in my car? They would have said yes if they were home, right? I didn't take a big piece. All you got to do is lay that pad on the ground. I know I used to very precariously try to balance the, you know, the stem in down in the soil and try to make it stand up. You don't need to do that. And I found that out by having cactus because sometimes the dogs would knock a pad off and lay on the ground and eventually I'd see it. And when I'd try to pick it up, that sucker was rooted. Roots come down right out the side of that pad and anchor it and then boom, it sends up leaves from that particular point. So I find little cactus everywhere. I found some little purple cactus up in Brewston at a abandoned gas station. So keep your eyes peeled. They're fun. Um, Stone here made this little, you know, sometimes that little area from the front yard to the back yard is just sort of wasted and utility and there's, you know, nothing really going on there. But I think it's delightful when people take the time to make that passageway from the front to the backyard, a special little garden area. And you know what? It looks so easy to control. Like maybe I could keep that area weeded and cleaned up and disciplined. But look how the wonderful little path takes us. And I noticed how materials can be mixed. I'm going to take that up here in a minute. And then one more thing I want to mention about this is the color. I love a soft gray. Um, I don't like white in the landscape. Of course, I don't like to have to things, keep things clean. So I do choose things in the color of dirt and dog hair, but I like that soft natural gray uh, repeated throughout the garden. And to me, it, it really enhances the beautiful plant materials. All right, look at the stone here. Uh, we got some gray mixed with some red brick. And as soon as we look at, you know, we, if you scavenge and I do, I pick up old brick here and there. I pick up concrete uh, blocks people have thrown out. Don't be afraid to mix them. And notice how the stone here kind of softens. I'm not real fond of that red brick stepping stone material you see at the big box stores until I saw somebody smarter than I, Bob Lyons, um, use it in a way that kind of softened it and made it blend in, made it look more rustic and less formal. So, you know, grab those things, mix your materials and, and uh, go for it. I mean, Bob Lyons was in charge of Longwood, um, graduate student studies, you know, very formal type garden. And this is his look. And I think it's great at his garden, Phoenix Springs up in Connecticut. He called it that because his old house blew up a gas leak and he had to start over from scratch. And this is his new garden. Now I say he's been there oh, 15 years probably. 
Stones can be made into gorgeous uh, water elements. This is back in Ripley, Tennessee at the Walkers. And isn't that fabulous? Just that simple height with that water trickle falling out into that scooped out boulder. So finding that right stone to do this kind of look is a miraculous thing. Now here, again, smart use of stone and rock is the theme, but I'm also gonna show you some things that they did, the walkers did to solve some drainage problems. They had some little pockets because they have a lot of structure and patio and driveway right here in this area. And the water was trapped and had nowhere to go. So they laid drainage pipe, but hid it cleverly using stone and brick so that you don't know actually when that stone is laid back down that it's covering a drainage solution. And I love looking at Dana's beautiful hands right here. Dana, excuse me, D-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. I have a, a maple I call Dana Walker because she gave me a seedling and it's one of my very favorite Japanese maples. Um, she does this herself. She and her husband work in their own yard. They've gone to Japan to study how to prune Japanese maples. They've got everything labeled. It's an amazing, amazing thing to see their landscape and that she does all this and keeps it so beautifully. There's another one that they did to cover a drainage area, just, you know, kind of hidden there and that, that water had nowhere to go. So they couldn't grow a Japanese maple there because it needs good drainage. But notice this is lower than the surrounding ground. The water's going to go there, drain that area and allow them. That may be a solution for you. You've had a wet area. You can either plant, you know, things that will like wet areas or do something like this that solves it and then you can plant what you like. Another one, water runs right into that uh, stone. It's a little river that may go down to a drain area. While we're talking about gravel, a simple outdoor patio area can be made from gravel if you find you a good level area and surround it with some kind of material to hold your gravel. Here they use some nice upright stone and uh, put you some chairs out there and voila. I uh, also want to mention the stump because I've seen so many clever things done with downed trees. I should probably do a whole program on that as well. But to make a little end table there, just a piece of stump, a little bit of gravel, and, and we all needed that outdoor area, right, to still visit with friends and neighbors during the last year. And if you don't have one, we're going to talk a lot about that in the, the next program I'm doing at the, the Dixon. Gravel's great stuff. I, I have really gotten fine. I love crushed gray gravel. It'll pack down hard. And that is going to be my solution. I've begun on this now. As you step down from my crushed gray gravel patio and descend down to my vegetable garden area. So study this for just a minute, right? What you've done, look at the bottom level. Um, you have used some, some you know, rock resistant timbers there to form your square, fill that with the crushed gray stone, tamp it down level. And then you're gonna do a second level up to make the next step and then the next. So that's very doable. I mean, shoveling gravel is not like easy work, but I can still do it. I can put it in a wheelbarrow and do a little bit at a time and pack it down. You get little tampers and work on it. And it's, it's a great look. Again, a box store a solution, but done with a little touch to make it elegant. This was in Baltimore years ago. And um, the big square blocks just with those little papers and allowed that to make that graceful curve. So just using ordinary materials, just doing it in a very elegant, artful way. Mixed materials again, we're back at Brad's. Notice he set the bricks up on end, which makes it a little bit easier to not only get it, keep it above the ground, but to adjust them if you wanna make a curve you know, if they were flat. Making um, curves, by the way, with brick, it's actually easier if you run them kind of diagonally. You can do a lot with that. Um, even if they're flat on the ground, you can make them wider where you want, curved where you want. But this was a good solution and I liked the look and mixed materials with the concrete right there. I'm gonna do this. I know I've shown this to y'all over the years, but look, it's so easy to find the right, well, maybe not easy to find the right stones, but you're gonna, or have them, uh, or cut them, you can do it, you know, with a chisel and a three pound sledge. I have done that. Make your rectangle or your square and outline and then ramble your irregular stone through that opening and you've got a work of art there. That's just a rock mosaic that I would enjoy looking at for years and by golly, why have I gone so many years without doing it? This is gonna be the summer, I'm telling you. Playing with water a little bit instead of just shutting it down a pipe and into the ground and away. Why don't we enjoy 
water cascading down, wetting those stones, making a little reflecting pool, a place for the birds to drink. Let's, let's just play with that rainwater instead of just getting rid of it. Some oddball things I'm going to uh, talk about here a little bit toward the end, so just things that have delighted me over the years that I've seen. I don't know why I love finding recycled objects in bits of art like this, but I really, really, really do. And you can see there we've got nuts, uh, nuts in there. We've got old ratchet. I can't think of the right word for them. But it's, you know, when you're turning a nut that attaches to your ratchet. And these old forks, uh, so many cool things. My eyes go around and just find all these interesting things in this mosaic. Now this is an upright piece of mosaic. It was just put onto a piece of concrete block. I'll show you a bigger thing here in just a minute, uh, a mold of a human form. But this could be in the ground as well. So have some fun with that. Save those old objects, put them together and arrange them and then figure out how you're going to make that into your stone. But isn't that cool? Look at, look at her hairdo or his. It could be he. I don't know. And the horseshoe smile. I just think that is so much fun. And spelling out words in there. I just enjoy looking at that for a long time. That I could maybe do sitting down. If I was doing it on the ground, it may be too much bending over for, for me these days. All right, using pots in interesting ways. I love doing my big colorful container combinations on my deck, and but there's something very elegant and wonderful about out there in the garden, putting a single pot with a single plant in it. And this I think is fabulous. The grassy shape, the way it catches the light. This is morning light miscanthus, which is not one that will reseed and be invasive by the way. So if you've got that little part of your garden that just looks like it needs something, promise me you'll try this this summer. I, I would love to see a picture of it. I'd love for some of you to send me a picture, tag me on Facebook and say, hey, I stole one of those ideas and did it in my garden and here's how it turned out. Because I always feel like I'm spinning a whole lot of words out and, you know, it's just air. It's pushed out here and my lips and tongue turn it into different sounds that mean something. But I don't usually get to see any results. So if you could share results, that would mean a lot to me. I promise it would. Pots, this is back at Brad's. Now, Brad likes to stage his pots, and so do I, up on things that are tall. Um, sometimes they're flimsy, right? This would be more of a thing that would topple over. It's probably used in a house or a porch somewhere. And out in the garden, it could be dangerous. So he just took his stones and really hem that thing in there with some big heavy stones and made sure that joker wasn't going to fall. Uh, okay. You know, and you know, how you end up sometimes you have a stone project and you end up with that jumble of piles of stone that didn't really work out. Well, here's some things you can do with those as well. Also drop in those canes just into that pot, just another strong architectural element right there. Um, just arrest the eye. See how they're beautiful. They're holding up your eye follows the circular elements there. So pretty cool. By the way, Brad has a thing for finding broken pots. <clears throat> Apparently he must just prowl neighborhoods and look for people who've thrown out busted pots because uh, most of his pots that I found in his garden, he said, yeah, that's one I glued together. Yeah, that's one I glued together. Yeah, that's one I glued together. So that is awesome. Another thing he has a found object somebody had thrown out and he picked up off a curbside. Uh, reflecting the light. So even that thing that would have been maybe tacky um, as an inside element, put it out in the garden that it catch the light and it can be absolutely fabulous. <clears throat> this was a little solution. Um, I have a lot of pots that sit on my deck, my wooden deck, and they stay wet underneath all the time. And I'm always looking for things to get them up off the ground so that I can both blow under them when it's dry or spray under them when it's wet and keep that area dry so that that wood will not rot. And this is the um, burnt on a stove, a gas stove, the eye that holds it above the, the flame. I know it has a name and I cannot think of it right now. But if you have old stoves or you know somebody or you can find these anywhere, what a brilliant idea to use to hold up your pots, right? I've been looking for some. There's Brad's uh, house too. Now this is out behind his garage and this is a double purpose area. That is actually where he has bonfires in the winter. And then come summer, he puts soil, he, he digs out the rock 
puts it aside, puts soil in there and plants it up for the summer. So it goes from bonfire to planting, bonfire to planting, depending on the time of the year. It's a lot of work. Brad, <laughs> Brad does a lot of work in his garden I might not do. Other special things with pots, you know, the succulent display, always one of my favorites that Tom Hobbs did. I hope some of y'all heard Tom Hobbs when he spoke at the Dixon a few years ago. Notice the little non-plant elements that he always likes to add there in his succulent, he calls these succulent pizzas. And you know, sometimes it's just that special pot. If you drove away from an antique store and you keep thinking about that special pot, go back and get it just one time, okay? Just drop the money. Because if you're going to enjoy it, you're going to think about how you wish you bought it. You know, save on something else. Save on something else for the next couple of weeks and drop the money on that gorgeous pot. I just bid on these, by the way. I hope you don't find these antique garden ornament bidding sites and bid against me because I'm dying to have those pots. And right now they're very reasonable. Other things you can do with pots, brilliant little water features. This is Cooper Young. Got to do Cooper Young. Walk around, get some cool ideas. What a great little place for the birds to drink, right? Land on those stones and sip that cool bubbling water. Love a little bit of water movement. I don't want a big loud water one. I don't like loud water. I have to go to the bathroom often enough already. And um, I want to hear the birds. I really get a little irritated when certain people whose names shall go unmentioned turn on music when we're outside working because I want to hear the birds and frogs and the turkeys gobble down in the valley and all that cool stuff. Uh oh, I don't know how that one got in here. Excuse me. Um, just some upright structures. You need a place. I'm always looking for a place to grow vines. I need little places like this everywhere to grow vines. And all that is is the kind of wire paneling that you can buy at the co-op or tractor supply framed out and then if you want to paint it a cool, this is a light purple, you know, I love that uh, for your annual vines or your vegetables. I, I did the tunnel thing this year and picked beans in the shade as I always intended to. And if you haven't been to the kitchen garden in Knoxville, please put that on your bucket list. It is the most adorable thing and beautiful purple elements all throughout, all sort of mixtures of pollinating plants and great ideas and vegetables and um, you, you will be love. Another little shot of, of the pale purple and an outside structure, just a structure. Doesn't have to be anything right here. It's just a frame for some potted plants, right? It'll probably help screen too. You need something out there to look at while your screen's growing. Here's, here's your idea. More with uh, pots and staging pots. Again, when those trees go down, somebody's cutting a tree up, stop and ask if you can have a couple of pieces of it you know, and put them in back and use them to stage as pedestals for your pots or for little tables around your landscape. Here's the overhead structure, okay? I did this in my raised bed garden finally last year and I grew an Italian Roma heirloom bean. It's hard to find a climbing Roma, but I don't like to bend over and pick anymore. Y'all, it was great. And you know where I got it? On Amazon. It's funny things you can find on Amazon, on Etsy, on eBay, you know, get on that, get online and search for those cool things and you can find a lot of unusual plants as well as garden elements. So that's a, a fun thing to do and adds a very special element to your garden. Um, again, raised bed gardens can be rustic and inexpensive if you know of some old um, livestock tubs around that nobody's using anymore, or you go buy them new and shiny and steel, that's fine too. So that would be something you could do for make you a raised bed. All right, I think we're getting toward the end here because I wanted to end with something really, really, really simple. Like if you do one thing from this talk that gives you pleasure to paint your house numbers or stencil them on there if you don't draw well, and put them on some pots They could be painted pots and put them on whatever structure you like to tell people where they are, then you can certainly do that. And that's gonna give you pleasure and your visitors pleasure every time you go in and out the door. Now, con con conclude with this last shot of my pond at my house because I thought that was just fun with those clouds. And if you have more time, I can talk about architectural elements, but I'm trying not to go too long. Where are we on time, y'all? I'm trying to time it to about 45. Yeah, we're now at 
one forty nine. So you actually have uh, you know a few minutes left. All right. Well, let's talk about a few architectural plants that will do a lot of these things that we're talking about. Um, I do love a palm, and y'all, there are hardy palms that you can grow in your landscape easily in Memphis and throughout most of Tennessee. So look for the needle palm if you want one that's going to actually be more of a tree-like palm, but the Chinese windmill palm will add that element to your landscape too that suddenly focuses the eye. And when I think about architectural plants and repeating and symmetry, I always think about Walter Anderson because his art to me has that wonderful structural repetitive element that I find very pleasing in gardens and in particular plants. And this one, of course, is about repeating the shapes, but notice this is also repeating the same color, even though it's not it's exactly the same color. So don't worry about being exact, right? The shapes aren't exactly the same either, but they repeat each other architecturally. So uh, some other, oh, that was some water features that didn't get into, that's, that's another area at the Ripley Garden where the water goes under and another one of their water features there. But architectural elements, when we talk about, you know, big structural elements, that certainly can be part of your garden. Um, but we can also talk about, hold on, let me get to the architectural plant. This is a whole other talk about architecture in the garden. Oh, but that's something you could do too. You need a focal point, a pedestal, and a pot on it with some art that gives architecture to your garden right away. Let me get to the architectural plants. I promise they're coming up. Oh, that was a round element. I'm sorry, I was putting new, new um, photos in here and they didn't get it in the right place because I kept on working on it. Circular elements, don't you love these circular steps? I just think that is magnificent. I've been trying to get my brother to do that. As you come out his house, it drops away fairly steeply and I've been wanting to get him to do that. Mm. Okay, here we go. I love the yuccas and the dasilarians. Anything that has that strong focal point. And by the way, these occasionally send out these wild and exotic blooms. And if you didn't know you could grow some hardy agave, please visit us over here. These are in the parking lot at the experiment station and you'll find whale's tongue agave. Now the big one just bloomed this summer, so it's gonna die. It's 15 years or so when it blooms and then it's gone. But when it blooms, boy, is that magnificent. And of course this plant itself was fabulous. Now behind it is the dasilarian. It's called desert spoon. And look how that plays with the light. It's just a gorgeous sculpture thing. Now it's a little bit sticky and prickly, but the yucca, yucca rostrata is not, it's a soft plant and will not prickle you. So if you wanna do this effect in your pots, look for yucca rostrata and there's a uh, blue beaked yucca is the common name. And we have some in our plant sale, if they're not all gone, or again, you can find them online at eBay. Uh, special pots, with perennials in them. Feel free to do that as well. What's more architectural than that? The umbrella sedge, you know, we always have these in our plant sale. We have King Tut, we have Prince Tut. This, the umbrella sedge is not one of those. They have more thin um, wiry leaves and they're not as hardy. But this one has been hardy for my family down in North Mississippi around Starkville. We put it at the edge of the lake to surround Mama's um, heron sculpture many years ago, and I did not expect it to come back, and it's come back every year. And if you know of somebody who has one, the way you want to propagate this is snag off one of those older leaves and stick it down in a wet spot, head face down, and it will sprout from every nodule of, between those leaves. It'll send up a several big shoots, and you'll have a whole new plant. That's how it propagates itself in the wild. It'll actually lay down stems and kind of walk around the edge of your, of your wet area. So a fabulous plant, and that is about as architectural as you can get. Here's a picture of how to do that. Just pluck that off, stick it down in that jar or in a wet, muddy saucer or in a wet spot of the garden, and uh, you'll have a new plant. It'll shoot right back up. This is the one that's not hardy. That is King Tut. King Tut's big. I would have called it Wild Hair Day. And then we've got Prince Tut and Baby Tut, which are smaller versions if you want to do them in some smaller pots. 
Pitcher plants are works of art. They're very architectural. And again, they like that wet spot. And that's fun for kids because they can also, you know, once the fly or the insect starts down into that leaf, that is not the flower, but the leaf, they cannot back up and the plant eventually dissolves them and uses them for nutrients. That's why you don't fertilize these. They do not want to be fertilized. All right, I think we might, well, let's talk about one more, just to, just to wind it up on plants with strange and odd structures. I remember the first time I met this plant, I got a call from county agent up in uh, Dyer County to come identify this weird plant. These people said they've been trying to kill it for 20 years. They said, um, it might be the devil's tongue, but it looks like the devil's something else and it stinks. So luckily I had just been to Tony Avent's garden, Plant Delights up in Raleigh, North Carolina. Otherwise I wouldn't have had a clue what this weird thing was. But these are, it, look at that scientific name now, Amorpha phallus. Does that tell you something? Voodoo lily or devil's tongue. And the reason it stinks is because it is pollinated by flies. So like a lot of flowers, this strange color, does that remind you of dark rotten flesh? They do smell like rotted flesh. And so they are very much conversation pieces. I remember Alan Armitage talking about the first time it finally bloomed for him, happened to be just in time for his daughter's garden wedding and she besieged him to cut it down and he would not. And sure enough, it was a great conversation piece. These are completely hardy here. Uh, they can be ordered online. I've even found them at the National Lawn and Garden Show, which of course got canceled again this year, but um, they are fabulous, weird, cool plants. And the foliage is actually very interesting, even when they're not giving you this very weird bloom. Look at those speckled stalks and the architectural foliage on them. I've got a nice specimen coming along now back by my hay ring. All right, let's wind it up. There's Noodle saying, come on home, mama. Anybody wants this grinning dog, I would love for you to take her. She's one of my many, many um, foundlings that needs a good home. And she is a grinner. People, everybody thought she was snarling at them, but that is Noodle saying, hey, I love you. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time and I hope you got some ideas today. Can I answer any questions? All right, that was good. I do see a couple of questions that we have in the chat. One is what type of umbrella plant was it that's so hardy? It's just called umbrella sedge. Um, I can give you the scientific name here if you give me just a minute. I can Google it up. Of the network basically gives more access to more people. You can ask me another one while I'm looking. Uh, I think that's all I saw. Miss Michelle Yellen had a question and she wanted to know what was that the name of that plant again? But Michelle, you might have to tell us what you're talking about. And that's all I see. Cyperus alternifolius. C-Y-P-E-R-U-S, alternifolius, alternate, so alternifolius, alternate foliage. Okay, we have another question, Ms. Carroll. You plant. spelled the name of the smooth yucca. The uh, smooth yucca is yucca rostrata. It would be like prostrate, but rostrate, R O S. T-R-A-T-A. -A. Gosh, that's a pretty plant. There's a fabulous specimen over here right in front of um, one of the restaurants over here, Rafferty's. <laughs> and it's a little blue palm tree. It eventually makes a trunk. In fact, if you come look at the ones in our display garden now, it's probably 10, 12 feet tall. Um, it took it maybe 15 years to get that tall, but it looks like a blue palm tree. It will not hurt you. So even as a baby before it becomes tall, you know, you can walk right past it and there will be no blood drawn. <clears throat> okay. Uh, before, I, before I turn it over to Miss Linda Taylor, there was a comment from Miss uh, Kim uh, Hayek, of course, from Cooper Young Garden Walk. And she definitely did appreciate you mentioning the Cooper Young Garden Walk. And I, I can't wait to be a part of that. That's what 
And she said, don't forget to mention that the Memphis Area Master Gardeners will be there to answer questions. So thank you, Ms. Kim. I always look forward to that Cooper Young Garden Walk. Well, Chris Cooper, when are we going to get to hear you play piano again? Uh, we have to find a piano. We can make that happen. You know, if you haven't heard him, y'all, it's a treat. <laughs> um, we need Thank to you put much. Put pressure on and make it happen somewhere. <laughs> I don't want to turn it over to Ms. Uh, Linda Taylor for any last words we have here. And I'm going to stop the screen share here. If you want to pop on so we can see your faces, that'll be fine. Hi, Kim. Carol, that was a wonderful presentation. We expected it to be great, and it certainly was. So uh, we appreciate you coming on and, and spending an hour with us today. I have no idea that Dr. Cooper could even play the piano. So I think that's a secret that he's been keeping from most of us. So I think by show of hands, we should all vote that we do a Zoom very soon and Dr. Cooper will be playing um, playing for us. How entertaining would that be? So. I, I mean, he won prizes across the South. I mean, he I had no energy. idea. He has been hiding that information probably <laughs> wisely from us. So um, he could have been Christmas entertain Christmas party entertainment for the last few years. So I actually did play for a couple of Master Gardener graduations at the Dixon when they had their. OK, OK, I well, I didn't know <laughs> you guys tonight at 6 p.m. We're planning if this wasn't fun enough, we're planning an auction and um, it's going to be on Zoom. We have. I, I'm not even going to mention how many numbers we have because we have about two hours and we don't know how long it's going to take to get through the, those items, but it's, it's a lot. And we've had some plants donated from many of the local nurseries. There's some great stuff that has come from the greenhouse that they have put in special containers and let grow out. Um, one of our master gardeners has built two just fabulous items that we're all going to be fighting over, I promise you. Um, so you guys go to the Master Gardener, uh, M-A-M-G, no, Memphis Area Master Gardeners org. click on the Spring Fling page, and then scroll down until you see the link to go to the Zoom for the auction, and it starts at six o'clock tonight. Um, so we really hope you guys will join us there. Uh, Carol, do you have a question about the- auction? Yes, I would love it if everyone that was listening and has some kind of little special element they did in their garden that they feel like I could include in a presentation like this again, please share that with me and give, if you would give me permission to use it. I love to include local creative geniuses. You know, I feel like we travel around the country and we think, oh, well, that's a botanical garden that's not something I can do, but I love finding, uh, you know, the things locally that we could do. And I would appreciate hearing back from you. I'm sure there will be, I'm sure there's a lot of that around the city. I know I've seen several things when we go on the gardens in progress tour, some things that are just very impressive. So um, any questions about the auction? If not, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Cooper to close us out. <laughs> 